good evening, everybody. I don't know, I warned you that the microphone only comes out of that corner. It's pretty loud over there. Can everybody hear me? It's a little tough with a mask on, but I uh, just want to make sure everybody can hear me. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Ward 1 City Councilor Tim Cruz. You have your Mayor Bob Sullivan here. Uh, Councilor Elijah Wynn Farwell. And Al is here representing Senator Mike Brady. Uh, there are some other councilors who said they'll be here. I do, do know traffic commission was tonight, too. That started at 6. Hopefully someone will be here in a short while. Uh, so we did, uh, Paul Ware and kind of the, uh, the group he's been working with put the agenda together. So we'll get to the agenda in a couple of minutes, but actually talking with Paul, we decided we'd have Jim Lambert from Woods Partners come up, introduce himself, talk a little bit about the project, and then we'll... As we get through the agenda, we'll get to questions under each kind of category. Does that work, Paul? I'll have the microphone. I'll come to you for a question. We only have one, and I don't want to have to clean it after every question because we'll be here till three in the morning. So, uh, when we get to when you have questions under each can, uh, subject matter, we'll just put your hand up, and I'll get over, and we can ask the question of whoever it is that needs to answer that. But in the meantime, let me right wipe this down. Jim Lambert from Woods Partners. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Jim Lambert. I'm the Managing Director for Wood Partners. Um, we are the development group who is proposing a multifamily housing development at the former site of the Braymore uh, Nursing Home, 34 North Pearl Street, as many of you know. Um, we aren't going to go through a full presentation tonight. I think many of you or all of you have probably seen that, if not once, then a couple of times. Um, either online at the website that we put together at Co Urbanize, which is uh, still up and running, and it's certainly available for you to view that information if you haven't already. And the planning department has uh, posted that information as well on their websites, and that's, I believe, still up and available for viewing as well. Um, just briefly, though, uh, I want to just give you the qu quick highlights of the project and you know why we're so interested in, in uh, developing here in the city of Brockton. Um, and I guess I'll take those backwards. I mean, we're really excited to be here. The city of Brockton, uh, you know, we believe uh, represents a great opportunity um, to develop a multifamily housing, a market rate multifamily housing uh, development. Um, it provides a new uh, housing option in the city of Brockton that hasn't been seen before. Um, if for those of you who aren't familiar with Wood Partners, we build high-end rental housing. Uh, we built well over 3,000 apartment homes throughout the state of Massachusetts within the last decade. We have another 500 under construction currently, and that just represents Massachusetts. We have 18 offices around the country, and we do that in about 20 states around the country. And um, we have a reputation for building Class A high-end housing, and that's what we intend to do here. Um, the Braymore site obviously is a, a, a blighted, crumbling building that needs um, new life, and we intend to do that. Um, we are proposing a 196 unit apartment development with 299 parking spaces. Um, it is a four story, it's two four story buildings. Have you probably seen the, the site plan? They're basically two U shaped buildings, uh, one up closer to North Pearl Street and one towards the back of the site. There's going to be some freestanding garages, which um, we have found historically that people have loved, that provide private parking with storage and obviously. Um, you know, some shelter from the, the, the weather in the winter here. Um, along with that, along with, uh, sorry, along with that um, obviously there's going to be some uh, traffic mitigation um, that we've looked at, uh, we've expressed, uh, we've, we've heard uh, you folks express concern about traffic in the neighborhood, we've studied that, we've studied it again, and we have some conclusions from those studies uh, that we think we can greatly improve the area. Um, both from what would come from the project, but also more importantly from what already exists today. So I guess, Councillor, with that, I, I don't know how far we want to go um, with an overview or we can just get into questions. Because like I said, most people, I believe, have seen the project. And um, if you want to jump into questions, that might be easier. Um, let's stand up and ask a question. And then we're
Yes, well, thank you for coming, and it's my pleasure to be here. I, you know, uh, we always love to listen to um, the concerns and questions and comments from, obviously, the neighborhood. Um, yes, we have, the traffic study has been posted, I believe, on the city's website. Is that, is that correct? Um, we've also, so, we, so there was, just to be clear, there was an original traffic study that was done. We've had a couple of uh, meetings, public meetings by Zoom, and the concerns that were raised in those meetings pushed us, and we went and did a secondary traffic study that was just completed a couple of days ago. I'm not 100% sure if that's been posted yet or not. If it hasn't, it will be imminently. And that really looks at the neighborhoods surrounding North Pearl Street, some of the, the, not, the, the less major thoroughfares. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. The data is there um, and very clear. It, it's always done on weekdays during rush hour, in the morning and the evening. Um, I don't know. In the interest of, we made an agenda, and if we jump around, we'll be here all, all night. Um, which we probably will be anyways, but uh, we made an agenda and, uh, you know, Paul and Ray and, and the group made an agenda, so we'll kind of stick to it. I think Paul Weir wanted to come up and say a few things, and you, most of you have an agenda that are left on the table, I think. Why don't you come on up here? Let's see what I can do. Let me grab my paper. Sorry about that. <laughs> and my mask is down because if I have it up, I won't be able to see what, I'm, what I've got written here. My name's Paul Ware. Um, I live at 161 Healy Terrace. And um, I actually got, um, oh, by the way, I just wanted to mention that this is BCA TV, uh, Brockton Community Access. And um, the recording of this will be on their website on demand, and it'll also be on YouTube. So you can go back and watch and listen to it all over again if you really have the time. Um, on behalf of the residents, I'm going to make some opening remarks and then kind of go through the agenda item. And if you don't have an agenda, maybe somebody close by does. Uh, it's just the, the topic. And uh, we'd like to try to stick to the topic, but you know, if you have an important question, ask it. Feel free, anytime. Uh, it's just like we'd, we'd like to take one topic at a time, and, and then at the end, maybe if there are other miscellaneous topics, we can get into those that we haven't thought of. Um, I'd just like to say, first of all, that I got involved in this about two months ago when Chris Minshall and Chris, would you, would you and Ray stand up? Because we, we three, along with Steve Morris, is he here? There he is. Um, have been getting together to organize this agenda, to organize the meeting uh, with Tim Cruz's help and also with the mayor's help to, to make it happen. And uh, we've been you know, printing flyers, putting things on people's doors, getting email lists together, sending out emails to everybody to tell them what's going on if we have their email address. So if you want to get on the email list uh, for future notifications and information, uh, there's some sort of, there are a couple of sheets going around where you could sign in and give us your address, name, and put your email on there also and we'll get you on the list. And if you don't, that's fine too. Um, just to start off with, no one in the, in the neighborhood on the east side of North Pearl and north of Pleasant, no one I've talked to in that neighborhood, or Chris or Ray for that matter, I've talked to in that neighborhood or contacted in the neighborhood have expressed any kind of a positive attitude toward this project. And so for the last couple of months, that's why we've been getting together to figure out how to find out more about it and to get make sure our opposition to the project is heard by the planning board and the city councilors and also the mayor. Um, we're, we're basically unanimous as far as we know. So. Um, you know, obviously there's an opportunity here for people to speak if they want to in favor of it uh, or anywhere else in writing if, if they want to. Uh, many of us have already written to the planning board and to the city council, uh, either in emails or attached documents, 
that um, detail our opposition and the various points that we have in opposition to it. Uh, and we've, we've sent that to Rob May also and also to the mayor's office. Uh, what we'd like to do tonight is review some of those concerns point by point, ask some questions of the developer and perhaps the city, the city councilors. Uh, there's a couple of questions in there for them um, so that everybody here can have a better understanding of what the project's all about and what some of the issues are and some of the concerns we have are. Uh, try to, like to try to stick to it point by point, like I said before, but uh, if you want to wander, that's okay too if a question pops into your head at any time. So the first thing I'd like to get into is uh, something that I said at the meeting we had on July 9th, which was at the gazebo in the uh, Hancock playground. And uh, the mayor had graciously agreed to have that meeting because the previous meetings that occurred with the planning board and the city council were Zoom meetings and uh, really weren't that interactive uh, with everybody being able to say what they wanted to say and with having, without having an extended period of discussion time about all the points we were raising. Um, Prior to that, for quite some time, uh, we, we had nothing except those Zoom meetings. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was just the representation uh, of the residents. And we are the residents of Ward 1, or some of them. I'm sure there are quite a few more. Um, the city council is our elected body. And I know that they're, we all know that they're trying to do their best for the city. But there's also an obligation of our, of our councilor to us, the residents of Ward 1, who elected him. And since the beginning of the process, it's, it's really been a struggle to get anywhere with having a meeting, having a discussion, getting a group like this together. It's taken us two months to do this, to get it together. And I realize COVID plays a big part in that uh, because of the restrictions but it's just been a real struggle to try to have a discussion and get all the concerns on the table and get them addressed. And so this meeting is really an important meeting to do that. Can I get rid of that one? Um, and one of the things was mentioned about the traffic commission um, <laughs> we had this meeting scheduled about a week and a half ago. Tim emailed me finally and said it. I had it set up. Um, and then on Monday of this week, I got a call from one of the counselors, uh, Rita Mendez, who said, oh, by the way, there's a traffic commission meeting, same night, 6 p.m. And it's, uh, they have a huge agenda. And so she and Jack Lally, one of the other uh, counselors, had to be at the meeting because they're on the traffic commission. And then the, another counselor, Dennis Yaniri, said, oh, he has to be there too because he's got some, uh, sorry, he's got some issues on the traffic commission agenda. So right from the start, we're missing three counselors here. And we're actually missing a bunch more who aren't even here, which really is not a nice thing to do. Uh, I can't put it any more diplomatically than that. Um, you know, that's what we wanted this meeting for, for the counselors to be here, the developer to be here, ask some questions and find out some information. And I'm not sure it's going to accomplish all of that in one meeting. So, and I know I'm talking a lot, I apologize for that. We'll get the questions really fast. Uh, one more point though. It, we feel that it's, so far, we feel that it's been a really rushed process. Um, the mayor said on July 9th, and I quote, uh, the process is not a done deal and it's not a bag job. However, the, zone, the planning board has already voted on it and, uh, and approved it to go to the city council or the ordinance committee of the city council. And in fact, the ordinance uh, committee of the council has already voted on it once with their five members. So now there are two more votes in the city council with all 11 councilors voting. And it takes a two-thirds vote 
to pass and send it on to the mayor to sign. That's my understanding, and Rob told me that, and if I misinter misinterpreted it, please, whoever he is, correct me. Um, we really feel that there shouldn't be any more voting until all of our concerns are addressed and all of our questions are answered. And we've got some proposals for, and questions about, further studies. And the traffic is one of them, and we'll get to that later. Uh, the third thing is conflict of interest. And uh, this is just a, a brief statement about Attorney Burke, uh, who is representing the developer. But he also owns the property at 48 Pearl Street and has sold it to the developer. That's our understanding. So it's, it's just doesn't seem appropriate, even though it's probably legal. I can't imagine it not being. But it just gives the impression that it's just not quite right. And so one of our questions for the city council was if there were any other uh, conflicts of interest or potential conflicts of interest that would require any of them to recuse themselves from the voting. So I, I don't think we're going to find that out tonight because only two, of the, only two so far, two of the councilors are here. Three? Oh. oh, Shirley. Okay. All right. So we've got three. Shirley Azak, Tim Cruz, and Wynn Farwell over here. Um, so now let's get into some items with questions. Um, our first question is about the 40V application. This is 40 Victor, which is a chapter of the uh, Massachusetts general laws that um, the developer is applying under to develop the property. And again, if I'm if I'm in error here, please, the developer or Rob or whoever can correct me, but these are what we, these are the things we'll, that we think are true. And if they're not, please correct me. So our first question is, um, 40V application looks like it has to include commercial uses in, additional, in addition to residential units. And so what we wanted to know was what commercial uses will be in the project and how have those commercial issues been considered for their impact on both parking and traffic? So that, I think that might be a question for... Okay. Where do you go? There you are. Paul, hey. Uh, there, are, there is no requirement for commercial use in a 40V. Yes. Well, we've ever, uh, what else on the application itself? Okay. Uh, can I just hold it out? Yeah, just hold it, don't pass it. All right. Uh oh, come on. <laughs> I'll, I'll stand this one. Uh, Wood, Wood Partners has said that all apartments will be market rate, yet, 40V requires only 80%, requires only 80% market rate. So there could be as much as 20% low income apartments. Um, Can I short circuit that? And so we want to know what that issue is and will there be low income and what's a guarantee that 100% well, will be market rate? Let me, let me short circuit that right now and say that the mayor has already said that he is not going to submit a 40V application to the state, city council, or anyone else. So that whole discussion is dead. And I believe he said that um, at the gazebo, and it's dead. So if a, so if a 40V application is not submitted, what does that mean in terms of the development of the whole, the whole development project? It means that they can't access state funding for tax credits for market rate development. So they're giving up, uh, or they're, they're losing um, tax credits from the state, uh, $2 million plus. Okay. So I guess the follow-on question to that is, what does that mean in terms of how many apartments will be market rate and how many will potentially be uh, affordable, low income, how, whatever the phrase is? If the developer says that he's building 100% uh, market rate, uh, he's building 100% market rate. If he is applying for uh, low-income housing tax credits, he needs a letter of support from the city. 
and the mayor has said that he's not doing a, a, a LITEC support letter. So, done. Okay. Question from Kim. You, you can't. I just want to know what the process would be if he did. Because they're allowed to. Even, you know, no matter what okay. he says, they're allowed to sell Chris, the building. You, you can't apply for LITEC after you've started construction. You need to have that in advance. It's a mechanism to finance the building. Hi, I'd like to address that. So the, the Walpole development was actually a, a development that we purchased from another d local developer who permitted it through 40B, uh, Comprehensive Permit State 40B, which requires 25% of the, uh, the units to be affordable, which is very common in the state of Massachusetts. It's the primary way that suburban development happens in the state of Massachusetts. So we purchased it. So to clarify, it absolutely was not 10% and then switched to 25%. It was 25% from the very beginning before we were even involved in it. It stayed 25%. That is the requirement in perpetuity. We had no impact on that one way or the other whatsoever. That's, that's just a standard way for housing to get built in, in Massachusetts. Good question. Um, I mean, to address the, the, the second part of your question with the, the, the setback and the design and, and the acreage, yes, it was on more acreage, but most of that acreage was not usable, it was woods. Um, we're not in any way saying that they're exactly the same thing. What we've said is that they're, that's a similar project in terms of quality and look and feel as to what we're proposing here in Brockton. We understand that they're different acreages and they're different size buildings and so on and so forth. There, there's no perfect example, there never is. Um, that also was in a single family neighborhood. Um, and those folks were admittedly before we were involved um, against the project as well. We built it, we built rapport with the neighborhood during construction. And we, from, from our understanding, we had never had any real issues with anybody in the neighborhood. And, and yes, we did sell the property. I have never said that I would guarantee, and I never could, because it's just not something you can do in business, anything. Long-term hold, short-term hold. What we do is we have a mix in our portfolio of properties that we hold and own long-term and some that we sell, and that's really just a market condition factor. Also, including in this development, we bring in some of the largest institutional investors in the country. Large banks and insurance companies that you've heard of, you know, household names, that write big, big checks to get these things built. Um, those folks have a lot of say in what the business strategy is in any given development. Now, that said, we are the developer, we are the general contractor, so we'll be building the project, and we are the property management firm. So, oftentimes what happens is we have a partner, they want to hold long term, sometimes Wood Partners doesn't, sometimes we do. If we don't, oftentimes they'll just buy our interest out, we'll continue to manage for them long term and stay in it. One unique aspect of, sure. Well, or, or, or buying you out. well, not in that case, Rob. But it, so that is often ha times what happens. So we have a property in Framingham right now. That's going to happen. Walpole was a third, uh, third party sale, but I was going to get to the, that part of it. So. 
With, to address the concern about if we were to sell the property and what would happen thereafter, this I can promise you, right, is if we're going to sell the property, it's because the property has increased in value substantially. We are not going to sell the property because it went down in value. Um, and if that were to occur, I guarantee you whoever is buying that property not only needs to come in and operate it at the, the same level and standards that we operate it at in rents, but even higher rents and at a higher standard because they're paying a lot for the property and they need a return on their investment. It's not very good business to come in and buy a property at top dollar and then uh, rip, uh, lease it all out to you know uh, really low rents. It just it doesn't make sense. It doesn't happen that way. Um, we can't guarantee you who that buyer would be, but that's you know we know that if we're to sell, it's because we're selling at a high price and the market dictates that and our partner dictates dictates that. I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure if I understand the question. A year down the road, we'll just be building the development. I was going to say, once you sell it, like uh -huh. you were saying, you have to keep it at 100% of this, or you don't have no accountability when you transfer it over. No, what I'm saying is, is that somebody who would buy the property at a high price, by definition, that has to do those things to, to have a return on their investment, is what I'm saying. There is no guarantee. That's what I'm saying. I, I it's not I, accountable. That's fair. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, Rod, do you want me to call? I don't know. Hold on. I don't think. I, let's let's do this. I'll, I'll hold it so we don't Thank you. Okay. Are you saying that there couldn't be changes in the market whereby you might need to sell the property and just cut your losses and where potentially the new buyer might not need to possibly, you know, rent out for lower rates, et cetera, just to keep their head afloat? I mean, I'm not sure that that's impossible. It sounds like you're... Can I just add to that one thing? Okay. Passive profit is affordable. Half of Brockton, the population, qualifies for affordable housing. Have they ever built in a city where half of the city needs affordable housing? Well, just so you know, one thing about that, the city of Brockton, I don't think Walpole was, is over the 10% limit for subsidized housing, which is why we don't look to get more subsidized housing in the city. In places, I think Walpole, a, a developer can actually go through a 40B and skip all of this but the city of brockton they can't do that because we're over the 10 percent limit so address the market sure. ideas sure I, again good question i mean I, I i'm never going to stand up here and tell you something that is you know that i could promise you that would never be true sir there is in theory a million different ways that the world could go and could we theoretically sell the property yes have we ever done that no we've never sold the property because it was doing terribly and we lost a whole bunch of money and we just haven't done that. It's not our business model. It's not what keeps us in business. I could never stand up here and promise you that that would never happen in a million years because that would be a lie, but it's, it's zero. We have zero intention to do that. It would be, a, it would be bad for our business. Uh, it, it's not our business model. It doesn't make any sense. I got a question about that. Uh, that's for instance, that you I, I know you said you could um, sell it, but one of the things I would like to see is suppose you decide as part of the community, you put a community center in, that any perks that you give us, it should be written in the contract that if they're there, they have to pass on to whoever buys that property so that you don't do something and then the next person come and get rid of all the good things that you did for us. <laughs> so I would suggest that that's something that should be put in the contract that if you sell it, there's certain things that has to be passed on to the new owner. Does everybody hear that? More of a comment than a question. Um, just so you know, a uh, couple of the, by the way, a couple of counselors texted me, they're on their way. 
Council President Shirley Azak is here, Ward 1 School Committeeman Tom Minicello, and Senator Mike Brady, who doesn't have a vote on this. And actually, address a couple of things that Paul was talking about, just so you understand anybody who wasn't at the uh, gazebo meeting. This, uh, the Planning Board has not voted on this. They voted just whether to recommend it to the City Council. So they'll still be, the Planning Board still will set the, uh, uh, where's Rob? Will set the parameters for this. Um, those things will be inside of what the, the mayor and the, none of the subsidized housing can happen unless the mayor brings it to the city council. And I've told them right from the start there'll be no subsidies, there'll be no tax breaks. And I, the other thing too is that it takes eight votes of the city council, just so you know, it takes a two thirds majority. So if four councilors vote against it, it would fail. Um, the conflict of interest, I think, is not. I mean, lawyers represent people all the time, and that's just what it is. I don't think we need to spend any time on that. Uh, lawyers do lots of things. Yeah, that wouldn't wouldn't matter. I, I don't believe that would matter, and I. Uh, give, give me that again. Actually, for the BRA, I don't know if he's done work for the city, too. No, no laws have been changed yet, Brendan. No, nothing's been changed yet. It doesn't change until the last vote. The city council, city council, still has two more votes to go on this, and the last vote is not till the end of August, the last Monday in August, which is why we're we're here. And this would have been on March 24th before anything was even filed, but the, the COVID came and we had to cancel it. So it was scheduled for March 24th. So nothing, nothing has happened yet. And that's why we're here, to get these questions answered. I'll get back there in a second. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, we did have a question back there. Thank you. So to, to address the gentleman's question in the back, um, so it sounds like there's a lot of concern about what could happen potentially after our ownership. And you know, something that we're more than willing to do is sign some sort of document development agreement that says this is 100% market rate. Um, we're not going to be shy about that. We're happy to do that whatever that document may look like. We're not looking for subsidy, subsidized housing here. We're not looking for low-income housing. We're looking for 100% market rate housing. We're looking to build a project that the city can be proud of. We're looking to build a project that would be, in our opinion, the nicest project, housing project that's been built in the city of Brockton's history. Um, we, we absolutely are looking to build something nice, 100% market rate, and we're willing to stand behind that. I did. Yes. And again, again, so if there's a development agreement or some sort of agreement that says this has to be 100% market rate housing, we're happy to, to uh, sign that. Yeah. Well, hold on. She was first. Hold on a minute. Hi. Um. I'm just wondering how we're going to have a traffic survey that is accurate before August when the world is shut down right now. Um, I don't think any traffic survey that's done, been done since March would be actually accurate. I mean, even just my own commute driving to work is not accurate right now. So I was just wondering how they're going to guarantee that that track is track. Can't hear? So the question is, how do we get an accurate traffic survey during the COVID epidemic? Because the, uh, the you know, the, the volumes right now obviously are, are not that high. Can we, can we delay that till the end? Because we've got a whole thing. We've got a whole section of traffic. Can we have Mr. Lambert define what market rate rents are right now? Sure. Actually, and just so you know, um, I don't think they were thrilled about it, but the idea of this, the three bedroom units are now out. They've taken those out at the request of the mayor and, and myself. 
Sure. So if we were to open this building today, um, our one bedrooms would rent for about $1,900 per month, and our two bedrooms would rent for about $2,300 per month. I'm sorry? No. It does not. Utilities, the way we build our building is the utilities are separately metered. Um, yeah, we do market size. We have, like I said, we're, we're development professionals. We have a professional management arm. We study the competitors. Um, we study the market. Uh, we, we don't take these uh, investments lightly. They're, this is a uh, $50 million plus investment. If we didn't think that there was a market there for that, we wouldn't spend that kind of money. And uh, we truly believe that this type of housing is needed in the city of Boston. It's needed in greater Boston. Um, we have a shortage of housing. We have a shortage of different types of housing. And this, is, this offering will give people the opportunity to, say, sell their home I know that the housing market down here is getting uh, very hot and people want to move here. So if folks want to sell their home, take some money off the table for retirement, and move into an apartment that's high-end luxury, this provides them the option to do that. Hold on a minute. Okay. okay, what we hear tonight, we have many projections as far as rentals, okay, based on assumptions. However, most recently on July 16th, there was an article on the Brockton Enterprise saying that Brockton area housing among most unfollow U.S. in rentals. It says study finds local apartments difficult to afford because of the combination of low wages and rents. Now, the wages in this area are below minimum wage, state 11.69 per hour. Okay? And this is a detailed article based on a national survey by the National Low Income Housing Coalition. It ranks Brockton area housing market among the most affordable in the country for local rentals. I don't know what kind of market research you did, but if you expect to just hire the millennials and people to sell their houses to live in an apartment complex, I think this is a pipe dream. Okay? And you can, you, who's going to sell his house and go live in an apartment complex of 200 units, okay? I think we're looking at the, in the wrong direction here as far as investment in the city and benefiting both the residents and the city as well. We should look for single family housing. I know your specialty problem is in apartment complex. But if you cannot, if you cannot switch gear to go into single family housing, we find another developer. Okay? Because I give you the formula. Okay? Single family housing gives you pride of ownership. And pride of ownership, <laughs> pride of ownership means stability. Stability equals strong tax base. And that's what the city wants. That's what the mayor indicated last time. That's what Tim Cruz indicated last time. And that's what we all want, because we want the city to have a strong tax base. Something can depend, you're going to get the taxes. The apartment complex is not a strong tax base. Those people are transient people coming from everywhere. They don't care what they're going to do and how they're going to live here. Okay? And they, might, they may attract all their friends and relatives to visit them all the weekend to take advantage of all the amenities on the recreational activities they're going to have, plus they're going to have uh, two marijuana pot spots down the street. They can get their fix over the weekend and have a blast. Okay, these are residuals 
residual problems that can be created to the city, and then the rest of the neighborhood has to put up with it. If you think we had problems with the fireworks over the 4th of July, we're going to have fireworks all, all year long. <laughs> okay? Because they're going to come down, get their fix, and jump in the pool. Or you have a blast, you have a party. And that's the thing you've got to consider here. We've got to look for stability in order to build strong tax base. Okay? No matter how you pay the picture, it's an apartment complex. Okay? That's what the city should look for. That's what all the people here are concerned about, because we're concerned about strong and stable neighborhoods. We're going to, we're going to change. We don't want to change the environment. This is a residential, residential area. And by building 200 apartments, it's going to support the area. That's the bottom line. So I hope the city will seriously consider that if you want to build strong tech base, dependable base in order to, for it, look down the, on Rockman Street. The last few years, the, part, the houses have been sold right away. Look down on Pleasant Street, the George Carney's development. They show like this. If there's single family houses in that area, they're going to be sold from the drawing boards. They're going to fly, okay? We don't depend on millennials and renting the apartments and, and all that. Those are projections and assumptions, and those are, that's cause instability. We want stable neighborhoods to blend into the area, and everybody's going to be happy. If you, someone comes up with a plan like that, the city will be happy, the resident will be happy, and no one's going to have any problems. Thank you. That doesn't really need, it. that's an opinion, so don't really need to answer that, but well thought of an opinion. Uh, where the gentleman was just discussing tax base, can somebody explain what the difference in tax revenue for the city would be between six to eight single family homes versus an apartment complex? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Rob, can you? One in one or two bedrooms, you won't see too many children, but it's a different discussion. Paul has something to say. Go on? Yeah, okay. which we pretty much have. I, I, I uh, sanitize my hands. So. Okay, that was great. Love it. Thanks, for, thanks everybody. Oh, Tim. Hold on. So my concern about, and everyone's concern about this, is is the high density. It's we're jamming all these people into one five-acre area. Walpole, you keep referencing, is beautiful. We went there first week we found out about this. I know a few of the other neighbors went, but you're putting one unit for every 1,000 square feet here, as opposed to one unit for every 3,000 square feet in Walpole. Now, I heard a question behind me about the tax. It's probably significant. But it's one tenth of the city's budget. It's five hundred thousand dollars. Sorry, one tenth of a percent. Thank you. My wife is much smarter than me. So, is that worth changing the landscape of an entire neighborhood? We have proud Brocktonians that live there that want to be there for the rest of their lives. That's again, maybe not more of a question, but uh, certainly a statement that I felt I needed to make. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next. And there's, there's still plenty of time, so if you've got comments about anything, anytime, you know, we'll try to stick to the topic, but later on at the end, anything. Um, is, is Rob still here? Yeah, Rob's in the back. Where'd he go? Oh, there he is, okay. So, it, should we talk about the, house, the HDIP, or is that off the table? That's gone. Okay, there is no HDIP. Okay, all right. Just wanted to be absolutely certain because I had a bunch of comments about that. Okay, so that item is off the table. Uh, that was the Housing Development Incentive Program. We talked about the size of the project and the comparison to Walpole. Uh, 
My next item on the agenda was parking spaces. And um, Steve Morris over there somewhere and I both came up with sort of a, a similar figure of around 400 or so parking spaces that we thought would be, necess would be needed for uh, the 196 apartments. Now that was considering three bedrooms, so maybe it's 395 instead of 400 in the estimate, but uh, it was gonna quibble about that. But definitely, we definitely do not believe that it's gonna be 299. Uh, and we don't believe that 299 is gonna be enough for the parking. And uh, even without the commercial space, that's not gonna be there now <clears throat> because of just the number of people who are going to be tenants there that are going to be working and have two cars instead of one car. And then what about the visitors? Where are they gonna park when they come to visit at night or on the weekend? So we just don't think that 299 spaces is enough. So the question is, if anybody else believes that, where will the parking, where will the extra parking be? And where will the visitors park? So that's a question. Thank you. Um, good question, and certainly a question, um, thank you, worthy of discussion. Um, understand your point of view in, in your calculations, but as I said earlier, you know, we've built 3,000 apartment homes in Massachusetts alone over the last 10 years, and we know for certain that a 1.5 parking ratio is sufficient for a suburban development. And what I really want to focus on is not the 1.5 ratio. It's the parking spaces per bedroom that we have. We have 1.1 parking spaces per bedroom. So when we look at parking, we say, okay, the 1.5, 2.0, 1.0, that, that gives you some indicator, right? But it really depends on what your unit mix is. How many one bedrooms you have, how many two bedrooms you have, how many three bedrooms you have. That tells you how many people are gonna live in the building, right? Um, at one per bedroom, what we know is if you have a two bedroom unit and two people are sharing it, they each have a car, then you're covered because we got one per bedroom. Um, like you said, there was some calculation, sounds like in your calculation there was commercial space that's not there. Um, and it sounds like there was, you know, obviously you we're calculating some three bedrooms, which um, will be removed from the project. So uh, in our experience, which is, is significant, uh, a 1.5 parking ratio is, is more than sufficient. In this day and age, people don't have cars as much as they used to. I know nobody wants to believe that, but it's true. They take Uber, they take the train, they travel, so not everybody's home at the same time. They work different hours. Some work first shift, some work second, some work third. We know that a 1.5 parking ratio is sufficient for this size development. And what about visitors? And that includes visitors. And you have half of your one bedroom units have a den. Every single one bedroom condo in Easton that I've ever appraised is using that den as a second bedroom. So where do your numbers stand if you do that? I mean, the bottom line is, like I said at the last meeting, um, the Pleasant Street apartments I drive by, for the 20 years my business was in this town, I drove by at least twice a day, two directions, and Westland Ave has always got cars on it. And that's fine, but there's no street abutting this that the overflow can go except North Pearl. So where does that mean they go? The cemetery is an awful option. There's enough, as we all know who walk the cemetery, there's enough trash left in the cemetery and stones knocked over. We don't need parking in there. And if it's across the street in our neighborhoods, that's A, not acceptable to the neighbors, but B, that's gonna be a nightmare for people crossing that street, especially if it happens at night. We're gonna end up with people getting killed. So, I mean, it really needs to be dialed down on how much parking there is. Sure, thank you. Um, I appreciate your position on that and your observation at, at another property. I don't know the property. I can't speak to that property, certainly. Again, we've been doing this a very long time. We do this all the way around the country. We've been, we've built thousands and thousands of units every single year in Massachusetts and everywhere else in the country. In our experience, that parking ratio is more than sufficient in this day and age. 
and I, I just I, I unfortunately just can't speak to other other situations for older developments. I don't know what their parking ratio is. I don't know what their bedroom count is. I don't know if they have three bedrooms, four bedrooms. I, I don't know any of that, so I can't speak to that, unfortunately. All I can speak to is with the parking ratio that we have at one per bedroom, we, we truly believe that is more than sufficient and that there doesn't need to be a plan for overflow parking because we, we don't intend to have that. When you, when you say you build all over the country, how many places have you turned, it, turned around and sold for different reasons? Good question. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that question. We've been in business for 30 years. We, 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 own, we own, we currently own and manage thousands and thousands of units. And over the 30 year life cycle of this business, we've sold thousands of units. I, I don't have the exact figure on how many we, we own and how many we sell at any given time. It, it changes annually. I apologize. We, we truly believe in the city of Brockton. We believe that there's a need here for this type of housing. We believe that there's a need in greater Boston for this type of housing. We would not be making a 50 plus million dollar investment if we didn't think that this was gonna be a success. We've done this time and time again. We, we risk millions and millions of dollars as do our partners who are very sophisticated investors and we truly believe that this is, uh, will be a successful project for the city of, Bro of Brockton. There, there's, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a million dollars of back taxes owed on that property today. Uh, we, no, I, 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 there's no, that, once the, once the, the, the zoning, if the zoning were to be changed and we were to build this project, going back to look for a zone and would do that's not really an applicable reason or necessary or it wouldn't do anything for us, I guess is what I'm trying to say. We don't believe we're going to have a lot of vacancy. We, if, if we did, we wouldn't be here. I, I promise you that. Uh, yeah, well, thank you, Timmy, for giving me a chance to speak. I just uh, heard about this a little while ago. How you doing, Bob? See you over there. I just speak from, uh, I, I live on the west side, right on Santee Road, and the last thing I think Brockton needs in the west side is an apartment complex when there's a bunch of other apartment complexes that are half vacant. And I don't believe that guy, because I just got here. I just got here. I was painting my house and someone told me to start at 7 o'clock, but I don't believe that guy, that he has a best interest in mind. And my neighbors urged me to come here and speak my mind, and I ran against Timmy, and for the 401 people that voted for me, I appreciate your vote, but nobody wants this high rise down the street. And there could be a million other things that we could do with it. And I, I wish people would be more honest with it instead of sitting by. Because in all honesty, when I heard about this high rise down the street from my house, I already identified a property in Maine with 360 acres <laughs> with three buildings for half the price of my house on the west sell side. It to him. Well, I'll sell it to him, yeah. But you know what? If that high rise goes in, I mark my words, uh, you know, I will be gone from this place and the west side will be a hellhole. And I don't believe you. All right. I don't believe you guys. I don't care what you think about me. Thank you, Jay. So since since we're on the uh, the history of of the wood uh, properties, have you ever built a place where we are cramming so many people in one small area, like the one unit for the 1,000 um, square feet? 
because uh, you know that is a concern about pretty much every point traffic parking uh, strain on the city strain on the neighborhood everything have you done that before has it been successful good question thank you uh, yes absolutely we have we, we do it all the time in fact I know it, it seems like you keep referencing units per acre and, and I appreciate that approach um, but we build all the time more units on less acreage. It's, it's commonplace. Um, obviously, you have to go taller than what we're proposing here to do that, but it is something that we do all the time. In Framingham, for example, we have uh, 196 units on less than two acres. And that's just a, a recent example that, in here in Massachusetts, but all the time, absolutely. We, they're, all, they're all on our website, absolutely. Yep, you're, you're welcome to, to take a look. We can, I, I'm happy to send uh, a list of properties that, you know, in other parts of the country or here in Massachusetts or both. I, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, we build all types of properties. We build high rises, which this is not. This is, this is a four story wood frame building. It's, it's, a, it's not a high rise, to be clear. Um, but we build high rises in other parts of the country. We build three story, four story, five story, you know, up to, 30 story. So it's all different types. They all have their own unique um, characteristics, but simply to answer your question, yes, uh, very often. No, no, it's, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it between parking ratio, height of the building, setbacks, how big are, you, are your units? Are you doing one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms? I mean, you have to put those all into a pot. And our architects and our engineers come up with a plan that fits in within all those parameters. It's, there's not one answer to that question. Thank you. because of all the old pipes. Are you going to take care of those too with that big complex? The sewage pipes need to be replaced on the main street going out. Yeah. And the water line, I know you got water lines in the sewers, and I don't know how bad. And I mean, we just get all our water and sewage in our sewers. Yeah. yeah. So it'll be a brand new building, so everything that we put in, all the utilities we put in will be brand new. Correct. Yeah. No. Our engineers have, have spoken with the city engineers, and it, clearly there's capacity um, for you know what we're proposing. Thank you. There was one in the back of Yes, they have to. Infrastructure, possibility, another expense. I mean, are you going to get people to pay $800 a month? So no, nothing is negative with the whole price. Everything is wrong. You're going to find people to pay $1,800 a month. Plus utilities. I think you've got buildings in the city of Rocky. You're the train. That's not. Yeah. Hi. Question. Hi. Um, I'm here for my parents. They're 87 years old, who never got any notice about this complex. Um, they abut the property, 
Are they on West Pleasant Street? Did you do any um, traffic on West Pleasant Street? Um, they have gone through quite a bit up in that area. Um, I, I noticed that you have parking garages, which is in back of their property. Are they gonna be one level, two level? It says six spaces, six spaces in each. I think that's what it says, it's too small for me to read. Um, I'm just wondering about that. Okay. The other thing was the traffic. Right at my parents' house, from Pleasant Street down, it's two lanes. Coming up from Pleasant Street, it starts two lanes. The medical thing department across one Pearl Street, that's where the gate is, right across the street from my parents. They're 87 years old. They walk to the doctors. I'm scared. Um, they were told before when the medical building went in, there'd be a gate. There's no gate. That was after somebody else bought it. So really, my mother, who could not be here because of COVID, don't let her out of the house. Um, she's very upset about this whole process. I think the one word that I'll just say is no communication. If, you, if somebody had gone to the neighbors on West Pleasant Street, it wouldn't be that bad. But she's talked to her neighbors on the phone. Nobody was notified. They just had two people there that just bought houses, I believe from November, and just somebody just bought it a couple of months ago. They would never have bought if they knew that complex was gonna go in. Rob, did you get back all the green cards from they should have notified? And we'll need to check those. Five hundred feet. You should have. And I did not. I will have to check their paperwork. We're going to have to see that the, they get return notification, and we will have to check that. Okay. Okay, hold on. We asked the developer to do the mailing, and they mailed it to people within 500 feet uh, of the property line, which is above and beyond what zoning normally requires. We asked them to do this as a courtesy because we couldn't have public meetings during the COVID crisis, and even now this room is over capacity. Um, but uh, the mailing did go out from Wood Partners, and I know people have called and say, well, we didn't get a mailing. And they say, well, how did you know about it? And he says, well, because we have this letter here that says, it's like, well, you got the mailing. Can you give me the list? Of the, the mailing also included a link to the website, uh, the co-urbanize. Co so... I, I know it was mailed. Can you give me a list of the mailing list that you used? Thank you. Hold on. Yes, hi. I've lived on Carlin Road for 34 years. Let me tell you, people cut through my, tr my neighborhood on a daily basis and it gets worse and worse. Within one year, we've had three portable speed traps. They come shooting down the street, bang it all the way around Healy Terrace. And you have to, unless you live on that street, you need to hug the road because you're gonna get hit. They come off the highway, cut up Healy, onto Carlin. So I got no notification whatsoever. We should have been one of the neighborhoods. Yes. All right. Actually, the next item on the agenda is the traffic, and that's 
the 800 pound gorilla anyway, so, but more than anything else, so hold on. I, I cleaned my hands too, so we're all right. Okay, so great discussion and, and some great questions. Thanks a lot. And again, there's gonna be plenty of time later, hopefully, and I think there will be. But let's, let's go to the traffic situation because this is m one of my gigantic pet peeves. Uh, like I said, I live at 161 Healy. Last year, uh, I was concerned about the traffic and the speeding coming down Carlin Road, all the bypass traffic coming both ways from Healy to Carlin and from Carlin to Healy at more than 30 miles an hour and a lot of it. Uh, so I got Tim involved, uh, we got Captain Hallisey of the police, who's the chair of the traffic commission, and Jack Lally, uh, who's on the traffic commission, the counselor on the traffic commission. Um, and we put up a sign and we talked about it and we had a little meeting in the traffic commission and nothing really ever came of it. Um, Captain Hallisey, I talked to this morning because I was concerned about the, uh, the conflict with the traffic commission meeting that suddenly occurred. And um, he said, well, they basically ran out of money to do anything further with that particular situation last year in terms of putting uh, police officers there, giving out tickets, and, and finding out what the real problem might be. So um, I've got some experience with it, and that's why I'm so concerned about it. So I took a look at the, at the what's called the Transportation Impact Assessment, which was part of the, uh, the plan that's on the website. And uh, let's call it the TIA. And, and basically came to the conclusion that it was pretty inadequate. Uh, they did uh, a study from 7 to 9 a.m. and 4 to 6 p.m. on two days in January. And they never, they concentrated primarily on the North Pearl Street uh, intersection with Pleasant Street and the entry and exit the driveways to the project and Bower Avenue and Allendale, Allendale and Bower. Nowhere else was there any effort to take a look at all the bypass traffic that goes down Carlin and goes the opposite way down Healy to cut around the intersection and cut around where the project would be. And the hours, the two hours in the morning and the two hours in the afternoon don't seem adequate enough to me because I can, I, my bedroom is on the street side of Healy Terrace and I know that rush hour traffic starts around 5.30, 6 o'clock and goes later. Um, it's, it's unfathomable to me that out of 100, 1,066 projected project vehicle trips daily, that only 66 of those are expected in the morning hours and 85 are expected in the afternoon. That doesn't make sense to me with 196 apartments. And I'll, I'll grant you, I'm not, I'm not a traffic impact or a transportation impact assessment engineer. But I did graduate from MIT, so I'm pretty smart. And I, I say that with all, with all humility, because that was a tough road. But still, you know, it's just the common sense seems to me that that's not enough of, an, of a traffic assessment to do a couple of hours in the morning, a couple of hours in the afternoon, and to get that kind of an estimate on traffic. And then never consider that in those hours there's probably a lot of bypass traffic going around the intersection that you're never counting. And then not giving any consideration to the fact that when a project goes in there and more traffic is on Pearl and Pleasant, that there's gonna be more bypass traffic going around it. So we really feel that, and I, I heard Jim say, Jim Lambert say that another traffic impact or transportation impact assessment has been done, I haven't seen it. And if it's been done in the last couple of months, I don't think it's valid anyway because we're not back to work. And we don't have the type of traffic, and especially in the summer with school out, we don't have the type of traffic that's going to happen in September through May or so with full unemployment again, or nearly full unemployment when we hopefully get out of this crisis. So we really feel that there's a whole new traffic impact assessment that needs to be done to, to take into account all of those factors. 
and some common sense rather than just rather than just kind of going by the book of what the regulations may say or what the the standard may say or what previous traffic impact assessments have looked like so i guess my question to you jim lambert is and I'm, I'm at a loss because I don't know what the new one is, but I guess the question is, when are we gonna have a really good impact assessment that takes into consideration all those factors? Thank you. So obviously we've heard a lot of concern about traffic and we, you have the traffic study, you spoke to that. Um, that study was done by professional traffic engineers who do this uh, for a living. They're certified, all so on and so forth. It was also peer reviewed by Beta Group, which was uh, a firm that was paid for by the city. So another third party that had comments. We addressed those comments and came to the final version that you've read. Um, so that, that has been peer reviewed by a city uh, retained firm, another engineering firm. Um, to your point about common sense, so we do have a follow-up traffic study. So we've had a couple of public meetings. We've heard a lot of concerns about traffic, so we went and studied that. And to your point about common sense, that's exactly what we did. We understand that it's COVID. We understand that it's COVID, and it's not normal hours, right? It's not normal traffic. But what we did was we looked at the neighborhoods across the street from where the development would occur and said, okay, well, what traffic calming measures could we put in place to not only address what we might create, but more importantly, I think what we heard was these things are, these problems already exist. So how do we mitigate what already exists? And the common sense approach that you mentioned was done and you'll read it, we'll, we'll, we'll get it to you. Um, and it basically, it, it, it's almost irrelevant what the counts are now versus non-COVID time because they're basically saying, here's all the mitigation you know, uh, options that you could put in place on the cut-through streets. And you can do all of them, you can do none of them, you can do some of them. So you'll see those when, when you get a chance to read that report. So you're saying that, as far as you're concerned, the new traffic uh, or transportation impact assessment has been done. And so once we read that, that's that's what you're saying is what you're going to do. That's it. It's done. No, we, 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 we're not saying that's it. We're saying that an up, we, we've heard concerns. We were asked to study another section. We did study that section. It's got uh, mitigation recommendations to address those concerns. We're not sitting here telling you that it covers every single street in the city of Brockton. I'm not going to tell you that. Somebody's going to look at it and say that... So, somebody's going to look at it and say... Understood, but in the neighborhood as well. Okay. Somebody's gonna look at it and say, we didn't cover X, Y, Z street, but we, the streets that we were told had the biggest concern, we took a look at, we followed up, we have a report. We, okay. we believe that's a good report. So when will we have that? We have it. Let's get it on the website, Absolutely. ASAP, if you can get it to the mayor's office or Rob. And it shows not just the, so it's a more deep, and I do want to have Steve come up and talk. It's an add-on, add but it also gives us mitigation suggestions. That might make all the difference in the world. In fact, Steve, Steve Morris, part of this team, has some background in this, and he was going to talk a little bit about this. So you haven't seen the new study either, of course. Thank you, Tim. I sent uh, notes out. Thank you for coming, Mr. Mayor and City Council. It was greatly appreciated. Uh, hold on. Yeah. We keep saying the website. What is the legal website? I have no idea. It's not on anything that I can do. City, City of Brockton. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is it? Brockton? Brockton. Brockton. I'm sorry, John. How's it? What is it? Hold on. Brockton at Brockton.ma.us. Everybody get that? Brockton.ma.us. <laughs> thank you, Tim. I just wanted to thank you folks for coming, and all you folks for coming, my neighbors, you know. This is really great. I, uh, 
I wasn't going to speak until much later, but we were talking about parking spaces. We, we were talking. Oh, so I do need the mic. <laughs> we, we were talking about uh, parking spaces and traffic studies and all that stuff. Well, I wanted to add something to all of uh, the notes that I wrote, and I even wrote a right mitigation. I wrote a mitigation plan to the traffic commission. They told me they would put it in the meeting minutes when they have their Zoom meeting or whatever uh, open meeting. They called it. Uh, and it, it, it's quite comprehensive. Uh, if you want, I'll read it to you later. But uh, Jim, I didn't want to, I don't want you to be offended, but what I have to say is not personal for you. I just don't think, and I'll be honest with you, I know, oh, I'm sorry, I know this should not be zoned for your property. You know, it's, it's too small, it's a residential area, it's, uh, let me read the note that I wrote, okay? I don't want to scare you away from Brockton. I hope you build seven of these complexes in Brockton, you know? And I can suggest you seven or eight sites that would be more appropriate for something this size, you know? I'm pretty good at that. I was an infrastructure engineer at MIT. I didn't go there like the smart guy over here. I just worked there, you know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that's why I'm asking you city councilors not to approve the rezoning. It's not to shoot them. It's to not rezone this property, you know? The traffic study stated 60 to 80 peak hour trips on North Pearl. My educated guess is that number would have an impact, but not overwhelm North Pearl. And that's why those numbers were used. I'll be honest with you, that's what I say. I used to plan and I'm an infrastructure planner. But the target demographic population will produce 500 to 700% more trips than the extremely flawed proposal states. I'm saying there's gonna be 300 to possibly 425 trips, I don't think 299 parking spaces is even close, to be honest with you, you know? And, you know, uh, that's not, I don't use, uh, I use common sense, I don't use uh, metrics, yeah? There is only one North Pearl Street for entering and exiting the property. You've got Melrose Cemetery, and you have Melrose Cemetery, and you have residential property, Albany Street, and, uh, and uh, that part of Pleasant Street, that is, that's it. You can't go anywhere else but North Pearl Street to enter and exit this property. Directly across the street from the entrance is the block of Nyland Road, Allendale Ave, a piece of Pleasant Street, and a piece of Pearl Street. There's five single family homes there and two single level professional buildings, you know? And you are proposing to put two four-story buildings with 450, maybe up to 600 renters, and a parking lot that will require, and I'm saying, 400 to 450 spaces. On top of that, a swimming pool, fire pits, and barbecue setups. And honestly, <laughs> that could ri rival the mansion fiesta every summer night. You know, I really, you know, a swimming pool and barbecue pits and fire pits for 400 renters minimum, you know? Wow. You know, it's, uh, and they could have visitors. It just could turn into a, a lunatic asylum every night. And I, they're only 150 yards from my back porch, you know? So uh, not happy. Uh, a neighbor made a great analogy when she said, it's like dropping a giant redwood into a flower garden. And sadly, the redwood would suck up all the nutrients and all the flowers would die. We're the flowers. Not, I added the last sentence, but somebody else came up with that quote. That was an awesome quote, you know, because I agree. Uh, I'm one of the flowers and I think that, you know, we might have to move. And I've sunk my retirement income into remodeling my house and doing a ton, you know, a lot of money in the last six years planning for my retirement, which was a year ago, you know. Uh, I'm requesting that you please, councilors, consider voting no on the zoning change, as even if this bill that backs out, the zoning would be an invitation for another proposal that would overwhelm, and the word is overwhelm my neighborhood, you know? It'll drive us all out, or, uh, you know, it's just, uh, and as I said, I, I sent notes to you folks, and I, I have suggestions about traffic mitigation, and I wrote them all up. If you're on the mailing list, and if you want, I'll put it on there. I sent it to the, the uh, Traffic Commission, and uh, Mary, who keeps the notes, the mem n numbers for the Traffic Commission, told me she would re have it read into the notes for the ne next open meeting, you know? And I'd also like to attend that via Zoom or whatever I can, too, because it has a great deal about uh, 
hourly traffic mitigation, uh, speed limits posted, uh, no left turns, no right turns, putting a left-hand uh, turn on Pearl Street in both directions, and I've said enough about that, but thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm the Redwood Tree Lady. Um, so, since Steve brought it up, I just wanted to add something to it. Um, I was on the website uh, looking at the plans, and I noticed something that I hadn't seen before. We keep hearing this is a four-story um, building, which is true as far as the apartments themselves. But the building itself, or both, are 50 feet high. If you take, I looked it up, a standard home these days, the ceiling heights are nine feet. So at nine feet, they could, that is equivalent to five and a half stories. So this isn't just really a four story, even though that's what it's putting in there as far as the amount of apartments. This is the, oh, sorry. This is the height of a five and a half story building if you take it by the standard of a house ceiling height. So I think it's very uh, disingenuous or, or um, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's uh, really given us the real deal here. I mean, I know, I know it, it's four stories, but when you look at it, the people who live on Pleasant and um, Albany, I think it is, they're going to be doing this, looking up at these two huge buildings because Pearl Street appears to me to be the top of the heights and everything starts to slope down. I live on Cashman Road and I'm almost down by the highway. So that's going to be the height. So now you're going to have this 50, story, 50 feet two buildings, and everything is going to be like this. Everybody's going to be looking up at it. And those poor people who live uh, right next to the property, they're going to have no privacy, you know, and it's just going to be a nightmare. So I just wanted to bring up the fact that I hadn't even realized that it was that high because everybody's saying four stories, but it's really a higher building than you think. This is my last one for the evening, but uh, so here's my question. One in three Americans haven't paid their mortgage because of coronavirus. Most people don't have a job. The tax base of Brockton has been decimated. Most restaurants are, are barely floating to survive. I know what the city budget is in a deficit, and the mayor could probably elaborate on that. They put this high rise up down the street. Who's going to pay for it? everyone's apartments when no one can pay the rent? And, you know, furthermore, that place gets put in. You're going to have a mass exodus of people from the west side. And I, I, I sell real estate. I'll put my house on the market so fast and I'll sell it to you who told me to move out. And I'll charge you a good price. Because no one's going to stick around. I don't want to, I don't want yeah, to, well, I don't want to, yeah, but still, no one's going to stick around. And no, nobody cares about that place. And everyone in my neighborhood told me, go speak your mind, DJ. So I have other things to do, but just, I think it's a terrible idea for the city. The city's already $25 million underwater. And, mind you, let me remind you, for the past nine years, the city spent $50 million on a water plant. We only got 2% okay. of the water from. Okay, so thanks, CJ. Have a great night, guys. Are we still on traffic? I think so. Yeah. Are there any more comments, questions? Any more on traffic? Hold on. All right, can you all hear me? Yeah, I think I can hear myself. So, so I. I I really kind of want to direct this more to our, our city leaders um, and uh, potentially, hopefully, to even some who aren't there who'd be voting for this. I, I think that this is, you know, 
we hear that we can put mitigating factors on the table to help to reduce the impact on our neighborhood, but that means that we're going to have a harder time having to deal with a new stop sign in our neighborhood or a one-way street somewhere that wasn't to be inconvenienced to accommodate this increase in traffic and all of that's going to lead to more congestion more time loss either on our way home from work or on our way trying to commute to work and it you know big picture wise because there are so many little de details i think i could get into but big picture wise the whole idea that this is starting as the pandemic is going on the whole idea that I mean, I understand. I've heard different people say, oh, no, this wasn't really pushed through. Everybody, you know, but it, it certainly feels that way. It, it doesn't feel like a good plan, and I don't feel like a lot of us feel our, uh, we're getting satisfying answers, at least at this point, you know? And, and when I hear the organization that's going to build the property say, we've run the numbers, we've looked at that, we've had experts look at it. I respect that, but I don't know when they were running the numbers, for instance, when they say 1.5 parking spaces is, is enough. What does that mean? After they built the apartment complex where they built that many parking spaces, did they go out and survey and get data on the neighborhoods to see how it was affecting them with overflow parking? You know, what, it, what does it mean to the people that aren't directly involved with the bottom line for their business? Um, and I'm not knocking, I, I mean, business is what it is. Bus you, you know, you can never expect less than good business from businessmen and you can never expect more and I guess I'm just very very concerned and, and I'm hoping that our city leaders even if it doesn't in the even if it seems like it's not going to lead to greater dividends up front you know I don't want us to be penny wise pound short and uh, at least let's stick a pin in this and you know we're in the middle of this pandemic do we really need to are, are people trying to flock to Brockton right now What's the rush? You know, give us more time at least. And, you know, it, it, this is not the time. Um, hi, um, I'm one of the uh, direct abutters on Albany Street. So I, I really appreciate what you said because um, what we understand is that they're going to level the grade and it starts up very. Um, uh, to, to the level on Pearl Street, and they're going to um, do a retention wall on Albany Street. Now I'm 45 feet from the pro from the property, and my excuse me. Mm -hmm. And our neighbor Gatachu is 35 feet. So we are the people who are looking up, but we're not only looking from up from okay. from our backyard, but we're looking up from an elevation which we haven't seen yet on the plans, but possibly six to eight to possibly 10 feet of a retaining wall made in block. What does that mean? That could mean a hundred different things. Facing us, that's gonna be the decor in our backyard. So we'll be looking up at 60 feet. The sun will come up an hour later in the morning for us. And in addition, the garages that they propose, which are money makers for wood, great. They seem to line the abutters that are a hundred feet back or the cemetery, which doesn't disturb anyone. In our backyard, we are the longest abutters, 125 feet, with a proposed 27 parking lots elevated directly at our bedroom windows, 27 cars coming and going at all hours of the day and night. And there won't be 1.5 cars, please. And when it gets crowded on the weekend, where are the cars going to go? You know where they're going to go, anywhere they can go on the curbs in the property, across the streets, in the surrounding neighborhoods, everywhere. And what's the plan to deal with that? The, the plan is not, oh, it won't happen, because we know it won't happen. They don't know that. They don't know it at all. So why aren't there, and again, <coughs> this goes back to why didn't they come and personally sit and meet with the abutters? I would have told them I've been in construction for 50 years. I know I don't look it, but I have been. <laughs> I would have proposed garages on the eight to 10 foot uh, retaining wall. At least that would have blocked half the buildings. Put them along the back where you have 27 cars directly shining into my bedroom window now that you can elevate the existing parking lot several feet to level the lot. There's a 10 foot drop from the beginning of Braymore to the back parking lot 
Yeah. A 10 foot drop, if they level that, that's massive. And then what are they gonna do with that water? They've already had to put catch basins in at the bottom of the cemetery for Rangeley. Those poor people are flooded out constantly. That all runs downhill. They're gonna put massive catch basins in or are they just gonna channel it through the retaining wall and dump it in my backyard, Cindy's backyard, Gatachu's backyard. And then let's not forget about the incinerator <coughs> or the trash compactor, whatever they call it, for 200 units that are right in the corner closest to all the abutters. Here are the abutters coming down together, right in the corner, that's where they place it. They're really thinking about us. No, they're not. They're thinking about the density and the bottom line and how much money they can squeeze out of that acreage. So, to keep it clean, and my mother would have washed my mouth out with soap on the oldest of 12 kids, starting in the projects and moving to a farm, that analogy of 10 feet, uh, 10 pounds of poop in a five pound bag, it's more like 20 pounds in a one pound bag. So, and then let's not forget that the natural buffer that was put in first by Braymore and then by Kathy's dad many years ago when he built this house, their dream house, which now affords us a total privacy six months of the year and partial privacy for the remainder is gonna be clear cut, clear cut. Every single tree, other than those up on Pearl Street, along the side and along the back by Albany, every single one a clear cut. Only one of my neighbors thinks that's a good idea because she has all sorts of trees down in her backyard. Free tree service for her. Her house is back a little. Again, we're 35 to 40 feet. They're gonna be working in our backyard. I don't know how long that's gonna take. What compensation are they offering us for bringing in equipment, taking over our yard while they, while they dig it up to set an eight to 10 foot retaining wall, block retaining wall? Again, whatever that means, whatever they want it to mean. I haven't seen any specifications. I haven't seen elevations, haven't seen anything. All we hear about is just rosy projections with no guarantees. If I built a septic system, I would need to have an alternate leaching field on the site. Yeah, they would have to no, we're not talking about a septic no, system. Okay. I'm talking, where's their alternate parking when it doesn't work? You know, where's the, where's the alternate uh, entrance and so forth? It's not there. Mm -hmm. It's not there. There's also, two. Oh, go ahead. Oh, also on my property, there's an easement for sewage. So I don't know if they'll be digging that up through the property or do they need to add more sewerage? I'm not sure, you know. So I would like to, if, if this goes through, I think um, we need all 10 properties that abut need to meet with Mr. Lambert and his company. And our address, but, I mean, our uh, issues need to be addressed in an adequate way. We don't, we don't need to be yes to death or it's okay, you don't understand, or we know better than you. They don't know better than us. We know better because we've lived there for 40 plus years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we on traffic, Paul? Are we on traffic? We kind of moved on from that. Kind of moving around, so whatever. Generally about I'd like to talk uh, more generally about including traffic. Uh, but first, I'd like to speak to $500,000 for taxes. I wonder if, if what, what them taxes are going to do uh, to pay for anything other than just the kids in the schools, and not uh, other services that the, it, that the police department, the fire department, the public works department are going to have to provide because that facility is, is here. That's a, that's a question for city council and mayor. Right. Well, I think every question that all of us have are for them. Yeah. To me, not to him, it's to them. Okay. Um, I, I have, we, we live down, we don't even live in the neighborhood, but we live on Pearl Street, and we own Pearl Street just like you do, okay? We live three houses up from Belmont Street, so you've been there. 
Okay, because you've been across the street from our house at the New Cumberland Farms, wonderful place. Okay, if I remember correctly, and I, and I don't remember correctly, but it's one of two numbers that are gonna be either 65 or 81 entry exits and when they built the new Cumberland Farms. That's all we're gonna be. We get that many in a, additional to uh, what they had. We had that many in a couple of hours. The cats are going in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, all the time. I'm not complaining about it. It's there. They had the right to be there, okay? We just have to live with it. But the, uh, um, whatever the traffic study says, trouble it. I believe the city of Brockton really, and, and we recently had an urgent care facility try to go in from, from the corner of uh, Stonehill Street up to our house, not including our house, but up to our house. And uh, fortunately, there was enough neighborhood uh, uproar that the, uh, that the developer just had, the city told the developer, you may be better go away because it ain't gonna work. I think this is, this is important for you people to be here. Real important for you people to be here. So this guy and that guy and that guy and that guy, hear what you have to say. And, but another thing I think the city ought to be looking at is when was the last time we had a, an overall planning and zoning study of the city? Planning study and a zoning study. 1967, maybe? No, actually, Rob, that the last three years, three years ago. Overall for the whole city? Yeah. yeah. And, and we, we have a book that we can look at. That we ha and we have, a, we have a, a study plan that we can look at. Okay, thank you. And, 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 how, and, who, and who did it? The city, the people are participating. There are lots of public hearings. Okay, well, I, don't, I, I try to follow things. I didn't, I didn't catch on to that at all. But I look, at, I look at a lot of the parts of the city, like we always traveled up and down Belmont Street. We don't dare to go out there now because we don't dare to go through the traffic light at uh, the street of our house. We have to go other ways. It's a disaster Belmont Street is. Empty building, empty building, little house, big building. And, and if the city plan calls for that to be okay, we need a new city plan for the company that actually knows what they're doing. And I think what, what we maybe ought to try to do, because we really like these people, is we maybe ought to, we had a lot of um, dealings with Braymore, uh, with relatives and stuff in Braymore and rehab and in the nursing home. We maybe ought to go to see the Rollins and get them back. They were great people. Thank you. I want to apologize for rambling a while ago, but right. I, I would like to just see a show of hands. I think we know what it will be, who's for and who's against this. Uh, since the cameras are rolling, it would be good for anyone who looks in on this to actually see that and not guess where everybody stands. And finally, I would like to propose that all future actions to do with this project take place in a public forum that we we no longer allow any Zoom meetings so that you can move forward, take a council vote, or anything else. And finally, if this does get approved, I request that all the barters be allowed access to the mayor and to Wood so that our, um, our concerns can be addressed properly. We're affected the most. Absolutely, and I can tell you, I know, I know the mayor. His door is always open. If it goes, and it's a big if, Woods, is, I, I know we'll be working with the neighbors. And the Zoom, I couldn't agree. The Zoom was not something we... The Zoom, there was no other way we could not do that. And even right now, don't let the governor see how close we're sitting. So I hope they can maybe Photoshop the uh, TV a little and spread everybody out. If you do, put two chins less on me, please. I don't live directly where you people are, and I feel terrible. I live off of Pearl Street. It's a little dead end, and we have cars constantly thinking it's a cut through. They'll park their cars, we can't get in. It's just a small, small road. 
try to get out onto Pearl Street. Never mind up here, go all the way down. Then you take a look at the school. Parents are dropping their children off. People won't let you come out of the road. They won't let you go into the road. Even when I'm taking a left to work, which is hardly any traffic, they won't let you out. Plus, not only that, we only have four crosswalks. And if you're putting all those people up there, the only three crosswalks that we have is on Belmont Street at the light, Tory Street on the light, Pleasant Street on the light, and the children's, which, forget it, the people zoom down there, they do, when they say 40 miles per hour, that should be cut down to 30. We started up close to the school, they come up 50, 60 miles per hour up that street. And I don't, I, at one time, a couple years ago, we had the police parked down in our road because it's got the trees, and he nabbed some of them. But it's horrible, and if you're thinking now, and, and like I said before, on Route 24, if there's a problem, this becomes the new 24. Now, do any of the council, I'm sorry, do any of the councilmen or the officials live on Pearl Street or off of Pearl Street that are making these decisions? Mayor? So you got some impact, you know, but I'm talking about the people directly that live on Pearl Street and off of Pearl Street, like I said. I've been in this city when I married my husband, 47 years, 46 as a homeowner. So, I mean, we're not fly by night. But if that goes through, I won't be looking for I'm sorry, your, your cute little whatever it's going to be, because I wonder, do you live in one of them or do you have a nice area? I mean, not everybody wants that. And the gentleman behind me was correct in what he said. The article in the newspaper talked about all the rental homes how they're being evicted, and people are not coming down this way because our, our rent has gone up. And there's nothing for them here. If you really wanted to do something, why don't you buy all the home, the open vacancy homes, redo them over and sell them. I'm sorry, what's that? I don't think it'd be a surprise, but you, how many people against? How many people for? There's a couple, so. Hold on. I've been here since this is not Bridgewater, okay? I'm looking at a rendering that's going to be a world-class apartment. I see blacktop, I see buildings, I see parking spaces. Where does the rain go? down on that poor guy's property that's got the 10 foot barrier. Because the general contour slope is down less pleasant. The other one that bothers me is why isn't this a condo project? We know what apartments bring. Look at Reservoir Street. The condos, at least you've got some skin in the game. Here, you've got constant transient. It's up to the city. Quickly, if he's been waiting. Uh, I just wanted to bring up something. I, my name's Clay Reichenberg, and I live a couple of streets down on Darren Drive. I hadn't heard anything about what went on, the meeting over at the uh, park, until after it was over. And then I did get a mailing the other day about tonight's meeting. But in between, I spoke to somebody that's over on Bower Avenue, this close friend of ours. And the thing that bothers me is we talk about not wanting this apartment complex. I don't know whether I want it or I don't want it, but the one thing I don't want is the thing that we jumped over and it's on that piece of paper in front of you, is a, re a drug rehabilitation program. We've skipped over that. If you guys want that there, well, I think just for thought, it's just food for thought. You've got to weigh all these consequences. Something is going to go in there. There's too much money owed on that property. Somebody, it's going to be sold to somebody to do something with. What is the correct answer? I don't know. That's why I'm here tonight. I wanted to listen to everything. But I spoke to this gentleman that's a friend of mine, and he said that's one of the things that was. And that's the last item, I think, on the agenda that we'll get to. Yeah, we'll get, wanna, well, let's, speak. let's see, but that's, that first? is on the agenda. And then we'll get to you. Oh, okay. All right, so my question is, is it's unfortunate that the traffic study was missed, well, it was done three days ago, right? And unfortunately, it's not on the website, but 
since it was done three days ago, we have it. So let's look at it. Where is it? Is it on the website? No, do we, does somebody have it here? Or did somebody decide not to bring it here? Because it was done three days ago. So we should have it, and we are all here now. So we should talk about it now. So where is it? So where is the information here? The traffic study was not just done three days ago. This was an update to the traffic study that was done in response to a lot of the concerns that we heard from the neighbors. Get in. I'm not talking for the mayor to say a few words. Yeah. All right. So. Also, I have another question. If this project is put in place, when is shovel getting the dirt? Uh, that's. Question, that's not, that's yeah, it's a good question. I. I don't know that you'd have. You have an answer to that. Though. Well, a lot of it depends on uh, if and when the zoning were passed, and then we have to go for a site plan approval. So, um, and then after that, it takes about seven months to design the project to get uh, to the point where you apply for a building permit. So it would be, if you know, if the timeline held as we have projected it, it would be sometime uh, middle of next year, early to middle of next year. Yes. Is there a way to postpone that so that people have to decide to move? <laughs> That's why we're here to get everybody. We tried to do this back in March before everything started, and we couldn't because of the COVID. So, yeah. listen, we're we're supposed to be out of here at nine, and. Uh, what was that? Oh, okay. And the mayor would like to say a few words, but I just want to, I just want to bring up a couple of things and let you know that some things have been proposed uh, by some of the residents early on in this last last two month period when we started getting together and, and figuring out what to do. There have been some proposals as to what to do, and in all reality. Um, and I, I heard this, that the, the city council has looked at other opportunities and they solicited wood partners and all that, but there are still other opportunities there. And personally, as in terms of the drug rehab, and you all have your own opinions, but in my opinion, that would be definitely the lesser of an evil in that, in that location because it's not going to have as many people. It's going to close down at night. It's going to be controlled. And so... It's, it's much different, and the thought of it may be a little disturbing, but again, just my personal opinion. Uh, what we really wanted to do tonight was bring as many people as possible here for the mayor and the city councilors to hear what we had to say, hear the questions, and some of the questions have come from people who weren't at the July 9th meeting because that was kind of impromptu and we hadn't contacted a lot of the people on like Albany and Rangeley and, and the streets behind the property. Uh, we had basically done it in the, in the Carlin, Healy, Nyland, and uh, that section of the neighborhood. Um, what we really want to ask the city council to do is take all these comments and questions into consideration and put off voting on the zoning overlay. The zoning overlay is the key. That's the next vote that has to occur for this to move forward. And if the zoning overlay district, it's called, is not voted on and or, and or not approved by the city council, or even if it is approved by the city council and goes to the mayor, the mayor doesn't have to sign it. He can disapprove it or reject it. So that's what we want to do. That's what we're trying to do here, to bring up all of these issues that we think maybe they've been addressed, maybe they haven't been addressed well enough. I don't think they've been addressed well enough. I have to look at the impact traffic uh, assessment that was redone and added to. So there's still a lot of open questions and we just don't think that anything's ready for another vote in the city council at this point. And when it will be, I don't think we know. So that's, what, that's, that's our major objective, I think, tonight. Um, so personally, I want to thank everybody for coming.
and the mayor and the councilors and whoever I missed, other city officials, okay? And uh, I want to turn it over to the mayor now. I want to thank you for, for everyone who came tonight, and I want to thank the councils. I do not have a vote on this, but I did get some calls from constituents that asked me to come here. Luckily, I was able to get back from the state house at 7 hours. State representatives are still in there doing business because they know Rep. Claire Cronin represents here. She would have been here tonight, but she's still doing business in Boston. But I did get calls from residents, so I know that the, t the concerns I've got from people were the traffic and the s impact on the schools. I want to thank our councils and our school committee member who's been here and the council and the, and the mayor as well. But um, I've got to get back to some residents who couldn't make it tonight. So you are going to do another traffic study? Okay, and, and, and about the impact of the schools and then the timeline, there's no answer right now? It's up to the city on the timeline. The timeline our anticipation, is that if were to go, our anticipation, as I mentioned earlier, was if it were to go through, um, the, the, the permitting process would go through early fall, and then it would take us another seven months or so to design the project and pull a building permit. So next year. Because yeah, we're also working on, we're working with our fire departments on building construction, new construction with non-combustible material. That's in the process of an economic development um, bill that's going through the state house. But, uh, I want to thank all the residents, and I'm going to get back to some of the residents who called me that couldn't make it tonight. And I know Councilor Cruz and the mayor will be passing this information as well, so thank you. And, and everybody, if you haven't signed, put, put your name, printed your name and your address, and if you want to get on the email list, wherever that paper is, get on it. And so you'll get a lot more information uh, via email, and we'll know who you are, okay? Well, first of all, good evening, everybody. Um, I want to thank you for being here. This is what a community meeting is about. And I don't know if it was Mr. Healy or Mr. Creedon when we were at the uh, 91 degree outside meeting, but they thanked me that night. And I said, you know what? So when we have it indoors, air conditioned at the Hancock, pack the joint. And this is packed. On a Thursday night in July, this is what it's about. Now, that same night, I remember Councilor Cruz said, if Bob Sullivan was the city council, he'd be against this. I think he'd probably be against this project. I remember I, I worked with Gene D'Ambrose when J.J. Lyons' house was proposed, and I was against that. Ron DeMazzo, the house next to you, I was against that. Across from Temple Bethamuna, when they were going to put four houses there, I was against that. But I'm not a city council anymore. I'm the mayor of the city of Brockton. And I have to be an administrator. I have to be a CEO of the city of Brockton. That's why I was got elected. And, and my duty right now is to put a project before the city council. And I have full faith and confidence in 11 city councils. And we have two of them that were former mayors, Wynn Fowler and Moses Rodriguez. So at the end of the day, this is a private property I took a tour of it when COVID started as the mayor because I wanted to know if I could use that as an isolation quarantine site. The place is deplorable. The roof's caved in, it's got mold, it's got asbestos, it's got lead, it's disgusting. So if another project had been brought to my office by a private developer to put a small subdivision, I would have done the exact same thing. I would have put it before the city council, you know, because we need to figure out what our tax, tax base is. But with that being said, Tonight, it also spoke volumes. It spoke volumes that I believe that we need to really investigate who did get notified and who didn't. And I'm a lawyer, so that's why I'm saying that. We need to really, and Council Cruz agrees, we need to really vet that out. Who did and who didn't. But I just want people to know, when I said that night at the Hancock Playground, I meant it. it's not a bag job. There's a whole process in place. There has to be a super majority vote, which is two thirds of the city council. That's been a tough, and I was there 14 years. It's not an easy thing to do. But I also have really good confidence in the people that are going to be doing their due diligence and figuring out. But also, we get represented by you. You elect us. So we're hearing you. We're listening to you. I made it clear to this gentleman the first day, as did Council Cruz, there's no tie. There's no HDIP. It's, it's it's, that's, that's a non-starter. 
And, and I was asked, do I live on Pearl Street? Well, I actually went to Pearl Street Nursery School in kindergarten, so I know Pearl Street very well. But I, my wife and I uh, live on Rock Meadow, right off of Rockland. I mean, I grew up here. My wife's from here. Jean's known my, 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 my wife since probably the second grade. So listen, have confidence that we're going to be doing the right thing. I mean, I hear you loud and clear. I mean, that's a log jam every morning. Cut through Nyland. And Mrs. Aziaf, please, she couldn't be here tonight. She wanted to make it clear she's against the project. She couldn't be out of abundance of caution, and I support that. But I just want people to realize, first of all, that it's a tough decision, right? Being a city councilor, being the mayor, being a school committee, being a senator, it's, 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 it is a tough position. But we're here because we're public servants for you. So I expected this to be heated. I'm very pleased that it was very professional. It really was. Thank you to all of you. But also, this isn't the, you know, this isn't over tonight. That the conversation and the due diligence has to continue. You know, I didn't, I didn't graduate from MIT. I graduated from Brockton High. And what I know about tonight is that the people are speaking to us. So I'll just pledge you again tonight. I mean, it's not on my, the ball's not on my court right now. It's on the legislative side. But I'm going to make it clear that what, whatever happens out of them has to have further scrutiny and it has to really, really be scrutinized. And that's really what I wanted to say. But I want to thank you all for being here. You don't have to be here tonight. You are. So thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Before we finish up, because we do have to be out, we're on borrowed overtime right now for the school department. I want to thank Superintendent. Mike Thomas for setting this up for tonight and the custodian for being here and setting this up and coming up early and putting the air conditioners on even though they're, they're helping at least. But I, before we finish, I do want to talk about and the last item on the agenda is other, other proposals. Now just so you know, you know I, I've had lots of people say, oh, we should do this or we should do that. Well, the city doesn't own the property. And just to let you know why the process did start, there is a time frame on this. The brain wall was taken over by, in bankruptcy, by a, a bankruptcy trustee or whatever. They put it out for sale. The highest bidder is Lambert Properties, Lambert, uh, Woods Properties, Ms. Lambert. They have a purchase and sale with a time frame. If this goes on too long, they'll be gone, and that's not my worry. If they are, they are. I, that's not, that's, that's business. However, just so you know, and part of the reason that I was leaning towards this. The only other bidder is a drug rehab. There is nobody looking to put single family houses in. There is nobody looking to put condos in. Those are business decisions. Now maybe, if this falls apart after this time frame, maybe that drug rehab com company isn't gonna keep going. Just so you know though, there is no way we can stop that. The zoning and the state laws are, are covered. If they, if that's who purchases the property, they can move in. There's nothing we can do to stop it. So my belief was I didn't want to see that. Again, this is big. This is, and I'm still wavering because, and again, I agree completely with the mayor. This is what, this is what we would have done before this was filed if we could have. I had the school booked, and then the the COVID came, and the governor says, no, everybody out of the buildings, we're not going anywhere. So that was my process. Again, it may fall apart, the time, the purchase and sale may go away, and if it does, it's, it's done. But just so you know, the only other proposal right now, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not trying to scare you and say there's a drug rehab moving in, but they are the only other outfit that's interested right now that has, that has put, put a bid forward. So when does your purchase and sale expire? That's a private, uh, they don't want to say, but I, I know they're on an extension right now. So, quickly, uh, Gene, hold on just so everybody can hear you. Recently, I had an opportunity to go down to West Elm Extension, and just at the Brockton Easton line, I saw the most beautiful one family homes developed by Jim Bertarelli, a Brockton family. Um, oh, has he been approached to look at this land? Maybe that's something that he would do on Pearl Street. Uh, and maybe he would. It would take zoning change. Single family, single family homes. 
And by the way, single family home, well, we can look at that. You know, that may be, and by the way, the people on Collin Road, just so you know, the project that the mayor was talking about earlier, the developer that was looking to do that was my cousin. And I testified against him and fought him at the zoning board. And so just so you know, that's, I try to make the right decisions for the right reasons. Don't always agree necessarily, but but that's why we're here. Hold on. And then we're going to finish up. I have a couple more. Yeah, hi. Uh, I live on right on the corner of Bower in North Pearl. So it would be right across the street from me. My concern is, is with what was brought up about the drug rehab. I don't want either one. I'd like to just stay the same, right, you know. But my concern is, is that we're biting off our nose to spite our face kind of thing. Trust me, I don't want the apartment building there. But I certainly don't want a drug rehab. I don't, I disagree with the man that said, you know, it's a lesser of two evils. It's not. You know, it's not a locked facility. They're a drug rehab. They can come and go as they, they want. If they don't want to stay, they can go. They can leave at 2 o'clock in the morning. Where are they going to go? They're going to go into our neighborhood. You know, so I have a huge concern about that. I'm not trying to cause issues here, but I live right across the street from it. My value of my home will go right down the tubes if there's a drug rehab. Would you buy a house across the street from a drug rehab? No. Is people going to buy my house across the street from a huge apartment building? I don't know. You know, if it really was a high end, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about it. I just know that the drug rehab thing is not cool. And no one's really said anything about it. And we really got to think, you know, what are we doing? You know, I understand. I really understand. You guys have convinced me that I don't want that place here tonight. But I don't want a drug rehab either. And if them are our choices, it really is not a good choice. And as a mayor, you want to destroy a neighborhood, put a rehab. There's plenty of places for rehabs to go. But I also understand, though, that we don't have a choice in that. And it would get in under education. Is, am I correct that it's already zoned for medical? Right. Part of it is it, rehab is part medical. So it, it's, uh, you know, food for thought for everybody. Thank you. All right, last one. Uh, I just wanted to point out to everybody that this isn't exactly a... Uh, traffic study there was no study done there's no traffic like saying like these this many cars turn on this street this is the amount of cars we're expecting on healy terrace and carlin road all it does is say hey we could put uh speed bumps on healy terrace and carlin road we can um make it a one way and that would solve our problems so that that's all that this is really said other than that you can see a map where they want to show you where the speed bumps would go and it just lists that so this this was not really a traffic study that that would be false in my opinion uh so that's all i have to say thanks all right thank you all right last one uh, direct this to i'd like to direct this to the fellow from wood partners what would be the consideration instead of 196 if this wasn't a four-story building to cut it down does it take it out of the profit value for you people by cutting it back you know if it was say one le one story less it might be what 150 units or 100 no that's a good question a good way to finish up yeah, if you, it's a four-story building, so if you were to cut down one of the stories, you're cutting out 25%, so roughly, you know, 150 units plus or minus, depending on how you configured it. Um, yes, unfortunately, I mean, that, that has come up. That's been asked of us. That's been um, commented on. And, you know, the property has an asking price. Uh, construction costs are extremely high, and they're not going down. And so, yes, unfortunately, there's a cost-benefit analysis, and that what you're what you're asking is not financially feasible no thank you um i think we could sit here till 11 or 11 30 and maybe we'll do this again in a week a couple of weeks we'll give you time 
I appreciate all the input. Um, it's great to see a neighborhood coming together. And trust me, it is not falling on deaf ears. Everybody is here is listening. Make sure you please, yeah, make sure you're on Paul's email list because that's how I'll get word out to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and thank you to the school department.